Hello and welcome to episode number 140, where I chat with Marilisa Sullivan, a physiotherapist and a yoga therapist who has researched Aristotle's eudaimonic well-being and is combining that with yoga therapy and spirituality to treat her clients with chronic pain and helping them to rediscover their health. A really interesting conversation, so please stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Elements of Ayurveda, Empowering Wisdom of Life. I'm your host, Colette, and in this podcast, I hope to empower you to take charge of your own health by sharing the holistic teachings of Ayurveda, the ancient healing tradition from India. We will also discuss topics like health and wellness, nutrition, yoga, fitness, meditation, breath work, and much more, as well as interviewing lots of inspiring people along the way. My humble wish is to help you to connect to your true nature, to Mother Nature, and to each other. If you like the content, be sure to subscribe to the show, and the new episodes will automatically download for you to enjoy. If you're new to Ayurveda, I recommend you listen to the first couple of episodes where I do an introduction to Ayurveda and the mind-body types. I've also set up a Facebook group for us to connect and to support each other. And I'd love for you to join me over at Elements of Ayurveda podcast group. And now here's the show. Hello and welcome to Elements of Ayurveda. I'm welcoming back to the show Marilisa Sullivan, who is a physiotherapist and yoga therapist with over 15 years of experience working with people suffering with chronic pain conditions. She is an assistant professor in yoga therapy and integrative health sciences at Maryland University of Integrative Health and holds an adjunct position at Emory University, where she teaches the integration of yoga and mindfulness into physical therapy practice in the DPT program. She is co-editor of Yoga and Science in Pain Care, Treating the Person in Pain, as well as several peer-reviewed articles. She also has a newly released book titled Understanding Yoga Therapy, Applied Philosophy and Science for Well-Being. Marilisa has been involved in the professionalization of the field of yoga therapy through the Education Standards Committee of IAYT, which helped to define competencies for the field and in characterizing the yoga therapy workforce through her research. Her research interests focus on defining the framework and explanatory model for yoga therapy based on philosophical and neurophysiological perspectives. Welcome back to the podcast, Marilisa. It's great to have you here again. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Now, Marilisa and I discussed the polyvagal theory and the gunas in our previous podcast together, number 131. And at the end of that conversation, Marilisa, you said that you were researching eudaimonic well-being, which really caught my attention. And I asked if we could have another conversation about that. And here we are. So I'm really looking forward to delving deep into this today. So thank you so much for coming back on the show. Now, Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's great. I really enjoyed our last conversation. I'm, like I said, I'm looking forward to delving deep into this. And I'd like to start by chatting about your over 15 years of experience working with people suffering with chronic pain and starting the conversation there. How can chronic pain affect a person's life? So one of the models that's really being understood in chronic pain aligns with the biopsychosocial spiritual perspective of healthcare. Mm. Um, and so chronic pain has effects on all of these different domains of health. So from a physiological perspective, um, chronic pain affects the person through things like autonomic dysregulation, which also impacts Um, the immune system, um, the inflammatory system, digestive system, endocrine system. So pain itself is a disruptive force to physiology, which can create a lot of comorbid factors like digestive issues, cardiovascular issues, um, hormonal imbalances. Um, From a psychological perspective, the experience of pain um, can 
um, facilitate or cultivate um, in different anxiety and depressive type of symptoms. So people can have a lot of worry um, and anxiety around what's going to happen from day to day, if they're going to be able to meet the things that they want to be able to meet, to do the things in their lives that they want to be able to do. And so in that, you begin to see this, this relationship into the social and spiritual domain of health, that in the experience of pain, people often have a disruption in their ability to participate in the activities they used to enjoy, mm -hmm. even the activities that really define their identity and their sense of self. Their relationships can become disruptive and they find it harder to have meaningful relationships. One thing uh, that the research is showing is that this effect on social connection also has adverse health impacts. So it's very cyclical that the experience of chronic pain can create a situation where the person becomes more and more isolated um, and they feel less and less connected to other people. And then that social isolation in and of itself also creates a situation of increasing inflammation and diminishing immunity, worsening the pain experience. From a, and we're going to talk, I know, in this podcast about the spiritual domain in a couple of different ways, but part of that is purpose and meaning in life. Um, and one of the articles I talk about in my book and that I really appreciate um, in helping me to understand this, it was called The Moral Experience of Pain. And it mm -hmm. talked about how in, the, in pain, people's sense of self, their sense of identity, everything about who they thought they were and were going to be becomes distorted and they're not sure what to do with that. So they lose this purpose and meaning in life, which what we'll talk about is how that also has this effect on inflammation and immunity and mortality. So it just affects everything in their life and then causes the snowball effects. And then those snowball effects reinforces all the issues in their health and well-being, basically. Exactly. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, this is why, you know, it's so great to have this conversation today. And in your work, you said that spirituality and eudaimonic well-being are two streams of research that will be used to consider restoring a sense of well-being to the individual living with chronic pain. And I'd like to break each of these two streams down, starting with eudaimonic well-being. How does eudaimonic well-being help a person with their chronic pain and, you know, starting with what is eudaimonic well-being? Yeah, so um, eudaimonic well-being comes from a teaching of Aristotle on eudaimonia. And eudaimonia was about what it was to live a fulfilling life. It was reaching the pinnacle of what you could be as a human being. And so really anything you can look at, like a chair's eudaimo eudaimonia would be when it had a stable surface, you could sit on it and it would hold you up. Mm -hmm. So anything, a plant, a tree, a flower, a human being has what is its highest potential, its highest fulfillment. So in looking at what helped a person reach their highest fulfillment, he talked about eudaimonic happiness and hedonic happiness. So hedonic happiness was something that's fluctuating, like enjoying a sunny day or enjoying ice cream or whatever it is that kind of lifts your spirits. Mm. Whereas eudaimonic happiness was a steadfast sort of contentment that didn't come and go. So he looked at this idea of how do we facilitate this happiness that is steadfast, that is ever present, that doesn't fluctuate with days and times and events. So in the research, they've used that, that idea of eudaimonic happiness to create this construct of eudaimonic well-being. So it's eudaimonic well-being is this type of contentment that is um, steadfast. And when they've measured its constructs to say what makes this up, what they've looked at is meaning and purpose, living in alignment with one's values, um, quality social connection, this idea of self-realization or self-actualization where you um, are able to uh, find your highest uh, fulfillment or flourishing as a human, and your own personal sense of authenticity or personal expressiveness. So those are the constructs that make up this idea of eudaimonic well-being. So if you, um, there is research that has shown that people that have higher eudaimonic well-being have um, less pain interference, less pain intensity, they have less medication usage, even in a chronic disease or chronic pain experience. Um, 
And there's also really interesting research about its effect on a gene expression profile that affects inflammation and immunity. So what's really cool about this research is that instead of contentment and eudaimonic well-being, and as we'll look at spirituality in a moment, instead of that being this kind of ambiguous, esoteric um, concept, what they've looked at in the research is its real physiological effect at changing gene expression profile, at increasing lifespan, at helping with anxiety and depression, and at helping to lessen the experience of pain and medication usage. Wow, that's fascinating. And you talk there about relationships. And when I was reading your material, it specifically said it was the quality of relationships versus the quantity, which is very interesting in today's world, right? Given how many people follow us online and these perceived uh, relationships. Yeah. And um, there's this, um, the research talks about this idea of perceived social isolation, Mm -hmm. because what they found is that it's not about the number of relationships at all. It's not about proximity either. So it's irrespective of being married or not married, having children or not having children, living around people or living alone. It has to do with, do you feel that you have social support? Do you feel that you have people that you could reach out to and that you can connect to so that you don't feel alone? And it's the feeling of being connected that is associated with these real positive health effects, such as on gene expression profiles that affect inflammation and immunity. Mm, Fascinating. And I know when they've done research on the blue zones throughout the world, these areas in the world where people live, you know, lots of centarians, high percentage of centarians, a big part of it was this depth of relationships in, in their community. Yeah, that's a very like complimentary stream of this research because mm-hmm. it has to do a lot with the quality of relationships and the feeling of living a meaningful life, Yeah, that you're enjoying your quality of life. Yeah. And so then looking at spirituality as the other stream of research that you were talking about to consider for the person living with chronic pain. So is this where yoga philosophy comes in? Yes. And one of the um, reasons I actually um, kind of came upon eudaimonic well-being is I've always been interested in spirituality and how it affects our uh, beliefs about health and healing and medicine. Mm-hmm. Um And I come across as a physical therapist working with chronic pain conditions. um, I've really searched for this way of how do I integrate spiritual work within my scope of practice, but also in a way that is congruent with the person in front of me. Mm -hmm. And so I've worked with a lot of clients that have a lot of different religious traditions. Um, And so in the field of research on spirituality, they really differentiate religion from spirituality. So religion is more of this organized set of beliefs that's done in a specific community with specific rituals, while spirituality is about themes. And so people um, across religious traditions have some similarities in what they consider the spiritual part of their religious tradition. Mm -hmm. And so it's things like, um, and you'll see it's very similar to eudaimonic well-being, but it's things like meaning and purpose, um, having a set of values that you live in alignment with, quality social connection, where it kind of differs from eudaimonic well-being is the way it speaks to either an inner connectedness or a transcendental existential connectedness. Mm -hmm. So as I was looking at spirituality and researching it and finding ways to talk about it with my clients and patients, I came upon these themes in in, um, spiritual well-being, but also this complementary field of research of eudaimonia. And so when I've presented to medical professionals, I've often utilized this language of eudaimonia because it comes from Aristotle's teachings. And so it can have more um, congruency with Mm. their perspective or their paradigm. And so what I love about it is just this uh, way that it gives us all these different languages to speak to something that can be potentially difficult to speak about. So in in reference more to what you're asking about with yoga, this is also where I really found I could articulate uh, what to me is the essential foundations of what yoga therapy is. And that is, is that yoga therapy comes from this philosophical and spiritual foundation. And 
fundamental to that foundation are things like dharma, uh, which has a lot to do with how do I find this meaning and purpose in life. Mm. Richard Miller has one of my favorite definitions of dharma, which is um, this idea of harmony, that when I'm living in a way that isn't that has harmony between my inner values and my outer world. Um, other ways I've, I've found people to find dharma is that it's a way of living that supports you and those around you. Mm. So the philosophy of meaning and purpose and dharma have a lot of congruency. In yoga philosophy, uh, in, in a text like the Mahabharata, they talk about the way towards this um, dharma is the yamas and niyamas. And with eudaimonia, a key part of that is, is the virtue ethics and living in alignment with values. So yoga philosophy holds meaning and purpose. It holds values with like the yamas and niyamas. There's the teaching of social connection um, through the idea of things like the yamas and niyamas, but also through the idea that we're all interconnected, that we're all um, that, that have the same essential self within us. Mm -hmm. um, and then yoga teaches us ways to have this sense of personal connectedness or inner authenticity, as well as more transcendent connection. So you can really see the parallel between foundational yoga philosophy, spiritual well-being, and eudaimonic well-being. Mm, absolutely. And I love that you just brought up yamas and niyamas, because I just recently did a podcast with Amy Wheeler. And as you mentioned in your work, you said that Aristotle's methodology of working with the virtues can be applied to the ethical principles of the yamas and niyamas of yoga, and may help in the development of the positive psychological and pro-social attributes. So can you explain to us the virtues in Aristotle's methodology and how they correlate with the yamas and niyamas. And given the fact that we just did a podcast on it, and for anybody who hasn't listened to that podcast, we're not going to go in depth into the yamas and niyamas here. I'll link that in the show notes. But if you could speak on the correlation between the two, that would be wonderful, Marlissa. Yeah, um, and I, I found this really exciting. So uh, what Aristotle taught was that the way to a well-lived and well-flourishing life was living in alignment with values, with what he called the virtue ethics. Mm. So what he said is that you could take any value, like non-harming, patience, generosity, humility, and all of them exist on a continuum. So that these values weren't a black and white thing, they weren't a rigid thing, they weren't a um, something that was put upon you from external. Rather, they were something to be understood in the context of whatever situation you were in. So you could take a value and you could say, well, what is its deficiency if I had too little of it? Mm. What is its excess if I had too much of it? And how would I find the optimal balance? So if you take something like humility, too much humility would be not taking up for yourself um, and not speaking up for yourself. Right. Um, too little humility uh, would be being narcissistic. Mm -hmm. Um, if you looked at something like patience, like too much patience would be not taking action when it was called for too little patience would be being impatient. Mm. So you would look at this continuum from too little, too much, but he also said you would have to look at what your nature was. So if, do I tend towards the impatient side or the side of not taking action? And then you would work in your life circumstance to find the middle. So he said, if you found the middle of each of, if you were to live in alignment with this optimal balance of each value that you chose to work with in your life, you would lead a well-lived, well-flourishing, the pinnacle of what it was to be a human being. And so in, in uh, yoga philosophy with Dharma, they speak to this very similar idea in the Mahabharata about how the yamas and niyamas are doorways to Dharma. So if I want to figure out how to live harmoniously within myself and the world around me, if I want to find a way to live that supports and sustains and nourishes myself and those around me, I would work with these yamas and niyamas. We're often very familiar with the 10 from the Yoga Sutras, um, but there's many more. And so in the Bhagavad Gita, I think it has a list of like over 30. Um, so it's really any of these values or virtues that, um, that assist you in living more harmoniously. So interesting. And, you know, it's interesting that Aristotle says that it's so important to know yourself as well. And I feel like that's where Ayurveda could come in, where you're understanding your own unique mind-body type in relation then to these virtues. 
Yeah. And so, and, and that's a really nice, I think, nuance to his philosophy is that, um, it's not that there's one right way to live any of these values. It's really a process of continual exploration and really understanding your own nature as well as what's being called for in any moment. Right. And doesn't that lend itself to spirituality, as you were saying earlier, whereas, you know, religion is more an organized set of beliefs, whereas spirituality is more finding your own path, I believe. Yeah, and you can really see how they begin to link together, because if you're um, exploring living in alignment with these values and these virtues, that's going to bring about a sense of personal connectedness, a sense of authenticity. It's going to bring about the idea of living in alignment with what is most important to you to give you a meaningful and purpose-filled life. And it's also going to help you to have that idea of self-actualization or self-realization where you're living to your highest. Yeah, there is, they're just such, such a great framework for life. Mm -hmm. And I, and what's really nice is to see, you know, these three philosophies from Aristotle to spirituality in general to yoga, we can find different ways to articulate it so that when we're working with the person in front of us, we can find the language that they need to hear that would help them the most in any situation. Yeah, I love that when you said you were doing a presentation before, rather than using yoga language, you were using the language of Aristotle because it would resonate better with your audience. And each of these are, you know, reinforcing each other, which is a beautiful thing as well. And it must have been wonderful when you're doing your research to see that. Yeah. And I think, you know, the research language of, well, you know, eudaimonic well-being has shown these health effects on inflammation and immunity, these health effects on mortality, um, on anxiety, depression, pain. All of that helps us when we're talking to health professionals as well as our clients to get to help provide them that cognitive sense of this is a valid um, and important discussion right. to have. Right, right. And I'd like to talk now a little bit about that. So as a physiotherapist and yoga therapist, Marlissa, how do you integrate the spiritual and eudaimonic well-being into your work with chronic pain clients and, and support them in this transformative process of, of rediscovery as you're, as you're essentially trying to do, Right. Yeah. And I, I would say, of course, it, you know, really, there's a huge spectrum of how that can look like I've worked right. with people that, that um, one woman I worked with had a very strong foundation in Christianity. Mm. And so she when and I'm not as familiar with a lot of those teachings. So she when she came to uh, work with me, she really wanted to um, bring things in from that religious tradition. So I just asked her, like, uh, you know, as we work with um, intention setting and um, cultivating a sense of ease or relaxation, um, a sense of meaning, what would help you? And she would bring in different verses or different passages mm. that would then form the initial intention setting. It would inform how we worked with relaxation as well. Um, wh whereas, um, uh, so I would say in general, the, the kind of format that I use is to first find out what is the quality or what is the kind of intention that this person has for their yoga therapy and physical therapy? Um, and then finding a shared language, be that a religious tradition language or a neuroscientific language like autonomic regulation mm -hmm. um, or a more uh, kind of plain language of relaxation and ease. Um, so really setting up the beginning of the practice to connect to this intention that they have. And then carrying that intention through the whole practice. So everything about the, if they're cultivating kindness or non-harming or uh, humility or strength and energy, how do we bring that into how they approach every posture we do, every breath technique we do, how we move into the meditation. Mm, so interesting. And I love that you're making it very personal and making it a part of their healing. Yeah. And I think it's, that's the most important thing about it is to really be able to set aside what it is for you right. and to inquire with the person into 
what are the values? Like when you look at this framework, like we talked about, what is the value that this person holds most dear? Exactly. Because working with that value is going to be the portal into them experiencing what is authenticity? What is my self-actualization process? Mm -hmm. uh, what is my meaning and purpose? Um, how do I connect more fully to myself and others? So I, I set it up really through that portal of entry of um, values. And I, I've been really enjoying the term values versus virtues because virtues feels uh, difficult as a concept. Yes. Where values seem um, a, a bit like something that everyone can say, oh, well, this is what I find important to me. Um, so really asking about as we work together, what it, what kind of qualities are most important to you? And if they're not sure what that means, even asking, is it a sense of peace? Is it a sense of ease, uh, contentment? Is it energy and vitality? Is it confidence? Um, Richard Miller talks about how these are all different uh components of our essential nature. So if you were to take any of any of these kind of positive qualities, they're all pieces or components of what we experience when we're held steady in that state of our essential nature. So really finding out for the person what is their overarching value that they're needing to cultivate or wanting to cultivate. Yeah. And like we talk a lot about this on the podcast is making the person active in their own health care. Have you seen or come across any research on that, the importance of the person being an active participant in their health care? I know that that is, you know, something that people talk about a lot, even in the idea of like creating the um, agency to cultivate change and that feeling that uh, there's tools about has a person learned to manage their own symptoms or manage their own conditions. So, right. Um, that's definitely, you know, something that is out there in the research. Yeah. And feeling empowered to go mm -hmm. forward and manage their own symptoms, like you're saying. And do you have a case study that you could share with us, Marlissa? So uh, one person that comes to mind is um, someone who came to see me and she came with originally low back pain as well as some shoulder and neck pain. So she had been someone who had done yoga practice before, but sometimes her yoga practice aggravated her symptoms. Sometimes it felt good. And she wasn't really sure, you know, what to do with a physical practice to help her. Mm -hmm. um, she had had a couple um, injuries in her life that had been really physically traumatic on her body, um, like accidents. Um, and so, but there was nothing, you know, she'd been to orthopedics, there was nothing to work on from that perspective. Um, so one of the things that pain science has been demonstrating is that in chronic conditions, the nervous system um, can be, become sensitized. So it begins to perceive uh, safe stimuli as dangerous. Mm. So, you know, with that idea of how am I going, um, part of my intention was helping this person to safely experience her body and to begin to work with the reinterpretation of how she senses sensation. Mm -hmm. Um, he also talked about feeling very, um, disconnected from her community. Um, and that included her yoga community because she wasn't able to do the things that she wanted to do. Um, and she talked a lot about kind of this feeling of isolation that she experienced. Mm. Um, so the uh, one of the original intentions that we had or that she had was to find a sense of confidence in her body um, as well as ease in her body. And so, you know, what we started out with was what would that feel like? So how, she, how would she notice the feeling of confidence or ease? And that led to this really interesting visual of like this wide open eye in her abdomen that was kind of looking everywhere. And the thing that helped it was when she um, brought in her dogs and the, the visualization of like petting her dogs and having them slowly close their eyes. Mm -hmm. So that was able to have help her feel the sense of, ease and comfort and safety and embrace and even a little bit more confidence in her ability to relax. Mm -hmm. So then we worked with movements that helped to strengthen that. How does she find this uh, calmness? How does she find this relaxation? How does she learn to self-soothe? Um, and, and then that led into a practice of um, 
working with really finding confidence and finding voice. So we began to move from the postures that and and movements and physical and experience experiences that cultivated ease to those that cultivated confidence. So we began with standing practices. We moved to inversions because she felt very fearful of those. Mm -hmm. So as she began to feel more confidence, we played with uh, that confidence by doing more challenging postures. And the way that showed up in her life is that she began to tell her yoga teacher when certain adjustments that he made actually increased her pain she began to understand that maybe her body couldn't do everything that this instructor wanted her body to do Mm -hmm. so maybe she needed a a different yoga community to find and then she was able to seek out and find the community that she could feel more connected to Um, so the the confidence in her body resulted in this ability to have more confidence outside to really um be aware of what her needs were mm-hmm. to ask her what her needs. And then when her needs couldn't be met by one group to really find that other group that would meet her needs. Oh, fantastic. So it gave her great confidence as well. And, and speaking her voice, speaking her truth. Yeah. Yeah. So that she was able to really understand like her, um, to work with the, the values of first, like coming inside the importance of self care, the importance of self soothing, being able to offer that to herself um, and then also to let that grow into how do I speak my needs? How do I have confidence to say, no, this isn't working for me. This is really what I do need. And to, um, you know, not feel bad about that or not feel like she wasn't trying hard enough or a failure because one community wasn't working for her. Right, exactly. That's beautiful. Really, like I said earlier, empowering the client and, you know, Udemonic well-being and, of course, spiritual well-being, we're talking about it in relation to chronic pain here, which is the area you focus in. But it really is, obviously, for everyone. Yeah, you could use it. And and it's, you know, really like the research. um, I mean, I'm not as up on the more psychologically based research, but Mm -hmm. certainly like in the chronic conditions uh, research, this is very present. Um, But, yeah, it's really it's really uh, relatable to any client, any patient population. Mm-hmm. And are you seeing people integrate it more into their work? Yeah. You're in the, you know, the physiotherapy and the yoga therapy field. Are you seeing this, this as being something that people are integrating more into their practices? Um, definitely in the yoga therapy world. Um, I think that the yoga therapists are, um, happy to find, happy to find this way of like, really embracing what we have as yoga therapy that's so unique because you know we have a very different perspective than physical therapy than psychotherapy than occupational therapy and so you know for yoga therapists to really embrace this philosophical and spiritual foundation in a way that's accessible to anyone is really paramount um And in physical therapy, there is a little bit like there's definitely, you know, more awareness of social isolation and social connection. um, But it's just less so in that in that field. Mm -hmm. And when it goes so well with the philosophy of yoga that you were explaining to us earlier, it just goes hand in hand, really. It's just another, like you said, another uh, way of speaking about it versus the yamas and niyamas. Yeah. And it's, it's just, a, it allows you to, for me, it gives you the confidence to um, know that this is a concept that you can talk about in a lot of different ways. And so the more right. ways that you have to talk about it, there are more ways you can introduce it to different clients. So like, for example, I gave the example of the person who we use Christianity for her to um, play with it in the practice. For this other person, we actually used a bit of the yoga um language because that was something that she was familiar with. Um, And for other people, I've used really neither language, just the idea Mm -hmm. of intention setting and cultivating that. Um, Someone that I, another person that I worked with who had um, PTSD and he was coming to me from his psychologist. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, what we worked with was um, again, like, how does he come into his body? Like often what I find is that that initial step is about 
coming into the body to form a positive relationship with one's own sensations um, and to find out what quality the person needs. So, you know, for him, it was about um, patience and acceptance and allowing what needed to arise. Um, and to offer a lot of that in the practice of a lot of silence, a lot of being with, a lot of allowing the process to happen in the time that it needed to happen, and to really give a lot of space for that. Um, and then through that allowing, we were able to work with different concepts like connecting to his family and finding that connection with his family. Um, so you know, I can work with these I, these components of spirituality and eudaimonic well-being without necessarily it having to be a quote unquote like spiritual practice that mm -hmm. it's about, you know, working with what is important to you to reconnect exactly. to yourself. And then how does that connection to yourself um, create culture or cultivate greater connection to either your family, your friends, your community? Um, and how does it help you to be more authentically who you are so that you're living in a way that you most want to live. Absolutely. That's beautiful. And it's, you know, the individualized care that we talk about in Ayurveda a lot, you know, the no one size fits all. And obviously as well for you, it makes it very interesting for you because each person that you meet has a different uh, views, it has different values and so on. So it makes it, you know, I'm sure each client really an interesting uh, case yeah. study for you. Yeah, it was it was interesting when it, and that's it is that's exactly what is so much fun is inspiring. I remember one person I worked with, she had um all she she had dementia with a probable Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. and uh, we were working with imagery and in order to you know bring like some calm and some ease. And we we're working with different imagery, and the imagery that she wanted to work with was going scuba when she was young and she went scuba diving with her husband. Mm -hmm. And like, to me, that was like, Oh, that must've been like a sense of wonderment and a sense of awe, you know, like seeing all of that. Mm -hmm. And um, so that, so I, I asked her like, what it brought up for her? Was it like a sense of awe? Was it a sense of wonder? And she was like, no, it was a sense of, for her. It was all about confidence that she never thought she would be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And that she was even very fearful of the experience, mm. but she did it. And not only she did it, but she succeeded and they went time and time again. And just that feeling of like vitality it offered oh. her. One of my yoga therapy mentors and teachers always told me that um, like you can, it's, you know, you can never go wrong by asking someone um, what they're experiencing and even offering if they're not sure where to go with it. Mm -hmm. Because if you say something that resonates with them, then great. It's like it resonates with them and that's great. But if it doesn't, then they learn to they learn what they're not experiencing. Right. And they also learn that when they tell you what they are experiencing, that it's valid and that it, you're going to go with that. Yeah, exactly. And the fact that you're making such a connection with them. And mm -hmm. that connection is very important as well, so that they are feel more open and more comfortable. They're going to share more. They're more relaxed in your presence and so on. Yeah. And I think as, um, you know, as people who are practicing or, you know, integrating yoga therapy or are yoga therapists, like we really um, have amazing tools to work with these components of spirituality and eudaimonic well-being and mm -hmm. to really allow our base to be yoga philosophy and that's where the movement arises out of the postures the um, meditations the lifestyle practices it arises from that mm -hmm. so in that explanatory framework uh, paper that we wrote we talked about how in the experience of pain suffering or disease someone's experience of their their relationship to their body their mind and their environment changes so if someone has a chronic disease like Parkinson's or MS or rheumatoid arthritis, their relationship to their body is painful. Um, they experience, they might, uh, they might experience suffering. Mm -hmm. They might experience a sense of betrayal of their body, not doing what they want it to do. Mm -hmm. they, they, uh, their experience of their mind might be to have anxiety or worry or depression. And then that changes the way they navigate their environment. Mm. But yoga therapy, especially when we really ground it in its philosophy, is about helping the person to develop the discriminative wisdom to 
notice this relationship to their body, mind, and environment that perpetuates suffering, um, and to have the practices that help them align with dharma, that help them align with this, what is important to them, Mm. um, their values. And then that shifts. It might not shift the disease, but the person begins to have a sense of um, acceptance, um, compassion, uh, forgiveness, um, even loving kindness mm. towards their body right. so that they really begin to take care of it and understand what it's asking for. They begin to develop that same sense of compassion and loving kindness towards their minds. Mm. And then that um, reflects in the way that they're able to meet their environments. So the whole way that the person approaches life changes through this practice of yoga. Wow. Yeah. Because that disassociation with that part of their body that's causing them suffering, like you said, will have an effect on the, on the healing if they are disassociated with it. And like you said, it will affect every other area of their life. And so essentially you're re- reintegrating this part of their body, this associated part back into their, back into their body and mind into more yeah. loving environment that, that can manifest or be the correct environment for healing to occur. Yeah. And then that does have a reciprocal effect Mm -hmm. because it helps to create more autonomic regulation, which then creates a a healthier, uh, potentially healthier effect on all the other systems like endocrine system and digestive system. It helps to diminish the amount of inflammation. It helps to support the immune system. So it also has this like real physiological effect that will help their systemic health. It might not get rid of the disease completely, Mm -hmm. but maybe they'll have less flare ups. um, They'll have longer remissions or they'll be able to be in a state of more comfort no matter what's arising in the body. Absolutely. And, you know, your work is really fascinating, Marlissa. And just thank you so much for sharing with us today. And I'd love for you to tell us if there's anything else you want to share um, that we didn't get to cover and a little bit about your newly released book titled Understanding Yoga Therapy, Applied Philosophy and Science for Wellbeing. Yeah, I guess I'll just start with the book. Um, mm. So um, the way that I um, wrote this book was that the first third of it is about how we apply yoga philosophy. And so um, storytelling, I think, is such a a great way to Mm -hmm. really understand philosophy, to really bring it into your felt experience. So there's a couple of stories from the Mahabharata. Um, And then I also utilize some of the, um, I have some different quotes from the Bhagavad Gita and the Samkhya Karika, um, because I I think that uh, one of the things that I think is so important for us is to read the words that are actually in these texts, even if they're translated into English, but to find translations that that uh, you like or to read many translations so you get to see it in many different ways, mm. but to um, really understand the philosophy in a really deep embodied way. And that's what I love about yoga philosophy is that it's not a, meant to be a cognitive exercise. It's meant to be something to be read, to be explored in the body. This one um, philosopher, uh, Gavin Flood has this idea, this word of intextualization, where the text writes itself in your body. Mm. So as you read the text, as you explore the text, as you read the philosophy, you begin to really experience what it means from a felt embodied experience. So that's really what the first third of the book is about. The mm. second third is for people's cognitive minds so that they learn the science behind eudaimonic well-being and spiritual well-being and polyvagal theory, which does give us some confidence about how we speak to these often ambiguous topics. Mm. Um, and then the way I oriented the application piece is that yoga therapy practices for body-mind regulation, so to cultivate these positive, uh, calm, easeful states Um, And then practices for developing that interoceptive awareness and discernment, followed by the practices that help to build resilience. The idea that while finding these easeful states is really wonderful, that life isn't really about staying in those states that can Mm -hmm. often create a stuckness or even a bypassing of what's real. So uh, we, we want to move from regulation to working with how to be with activated states of the mind or the body, or to be with life stressors and to change the way that we are in relationship to them. So the, um, so that's really what the book is about. And what I'm hoping in my research to do is to continue to find ways to, um, demonstrate 
the effect of yoga for when it's uh, based on a philosophical foundation um, to improve body, mind, health, and well-being in different conditions. So one of the things I'd like for you for yoga research to move into is to really um, get outside this reductionist viewpoint mm -hmm. of um, you know, here, which asana is best for low back pain, because that's physical therapy. Yes. What I really want yoga research to uh, dive into is how does working with this philosophical basis, um, this idea of eudaimonic well-being, this idea of spiritual well-being, this idea of autonomic regulation and resilience, cultivate greater health on a physical and mental uh, perspectives. Mm. So that you know, regardless of disease state, what we're trying to do in yoga therapy is to cultivate this eudaimonic spiritual well-being, which then cascades into greater autonomic regulation and resilience, which then cultivates this systemic health and well-being. So that's what I'm looking to do in my research is to um, explore that. Well, like I said, your work is fascinating. I love talking with you. I always learn lots. And so, Marlissa, where can people find your book and also your offerings? And, and maybe tell us a little bit about your offerings and um, your website. So my book is on Amazon, mm -hmm. um, but it's also, it was, it was published by uh, Rutledge or Taylor and Francis. So you can find it there as well. Um, and my website is marlisasullivan.com. And on my website, I have like um, some different publications. I have chapter two of my book. Um, and, um, right now I'm teaching full time at Maryland University of Integrative Health in the yoga therapy program. Um, so that's really what I'm doing full time. I am looking at trying to offer some workshops around the book, but I haven't gotten to that yet. Yes, yes, yes. Well, like you said, you're, you're busy right now because there's a whole change in online learning for your full yeah. semester, right? So you're up to your eyeballs and putting things online right now. Yeah. Yeah. Which is great because it's helping me to, you know, be able to do that to offer some workshops in the future. Absolutely. Yes. So that's a great way of looking at it. You're, you're learning more about the online learning platforms. Yeah. I guess one other thing that I am doing with my co-editors, um, Shelly Prosco and Neil Pearson, mm -hmm. uh, we are offering a like webinar book series um, and that'll be on my website at some point, but okay. it's, it's about um, the yoga and science and pain care book. And each author, um, each chapter author is actually going to present one webinar. Oh. So Neil Shelley and I present, but also each person who talked about um, their aspect of pain care will also be presenting. So that'll be on my website soon, but it's not out there yet. Oh, wonderful. That's great. Okay. And then if you want to let me know when that's out there, I will put, you know, I'll put it up on the Facebook group okay, to thanks. let people know, give them a heads up that it's there. Marlissa, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate the work you're doing. Very important research and work you're doing in the world. And I really appreciate you sharing with us. Thank you for the opportunity to share. And it's great talking to you. Yeah. Anytime you want to come back and say and tell us more, you're always welcome. <laughs> Once I do some research, I have some more um, news for you. There. I love it. I love it. Okay, Marilissa, thanks a million and take good care of yourself. And we'll chat again soon, hopefully. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. I hope you enjoy that conversation with Marilissa. Some really interesting information and research there. And please check out Marilissa's links in the show notes. Also in the show notes, you'll find a link to the Elements of Ayurveda podcast Facebook group, to the Patreon page where you can support the podcast and leave a tip in the tip jar if you wish. And if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the podcast so the new episodes will automatically download for you and rate and review it wherever you listen to your podcasts. I would truly appreciate that. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for your support. And until next time, take good care of yourself. Be well and ciao for now. <laughs>